All right, uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome our first speaker uh, of this year's colloquium series. Uh, Adam Lopez uh, is uh, assistant research professor of computer science at Johns Hopkins University uh, in the Center for Language and Speech Processing. Uh, speech and Language Processing. Um, and uh, Adam uh, did his PhD with Philip Resnick at the University of Maryland. Uh, in fact, he and I were uh, a long time together in grad school. He was uh, my next door neighbor when we would uh, late at night complain about the fact about things like that. But, uh, Adam has done some really uh, remarkable work in uh, machine translation and looking at uh, you know problems that we thought had been solved a long time ago, you know, 60s and 70s, uh, formal problems and how they relate to uh, practical issues that uh, we, we need to deal with. In, that come up in, uh, in, uh, in machine translation. Um, this uh, he's actually at uh, Johns Hopkins now, but uh, he is leaving uh, to join the faculty uh, of the Department of Informatics uh, at the University of Edinburgh uh, this uh, this fall, where he will be uh, a reader. Uh, so he, uh, the count was one of our Edinburgh visitors. We've now uh, had probably half of that department in the last uh, year or so. Um, so that's uh, that's going to be a really uh, exciting place, uh, and he knows that because he was a postdoc there with uh, Philip Cruen. Uh, so uh, he's been around the world also quite a lot. So um, please give me your attention. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about translation. This will be somewhat of an unusual translation talk. Uh, it will have. Um, some tutorial stuff uh, for a little while, and I'll, I'll talk about some Part of this is because uh, there are some, some fairly deep technical issues in here uh, that I don't want to gloss over. Um, so I'm going to focus more on the intuitions than proofs or anything like that, um, but hopefully it will be interesting. Um, and so, as Chris mentioned, uh, a lot of what I do is in translation. This is, of course, a very old problem. Um, and even in terms of the history of computing, um, translation is quite old. So if we uh, go all the way back to through the history of machine translation, we see it uh, is basically concurrent with the history of computing. Um, and despite the fact that people have been working on this uh, problem since basically the beginning of computing, uh, there wasn't necessarily a lot of progress for a long time. So. I was in graduate school in 2004, and when I arrived uh, in graduate school, um, this was basically the vision that this is the uh, the conception that most graduate students uh, had of machine translation in 2004. Uh, and so, if we flash forward to now, uh, I'm sure there are some first year graduate students in the room. And so, uh, well, I, I should say uh, this is this is maybe a little bit unfair. Uh, to NT, since I work in, in NT, and so I should say the conception of many other NLP technologies was actually not all that much better. Um, so, but now, flash forward to now, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of first year graduate students in the room, uh, and so hopefully you came in with a picture, a popular view of NT that is something more like this. So, uh, machine translation is no longer uh, science fiction, it's science facts. Uh, and the rest of my friends in NLP have also, I think, been doing a, a fairly good job of keeping up. So there's, we've had a lot of uh, uh, applied successes in MIT. Uh, and so, so much so, so that uh, MIT is now uh, a popular university course. There's one that's taught here. Um, uh, so this is some, some stuff that uh, I had done at Hopkins. I, I think uh, Chris borrowed some of his course here. Um, and so this is something you can actually teach in like a semester long course. Uh, so one question is what, what happened in those 10 years? And I think probably most of us here already know the answer is, we found a lot of data, and we applied machine learning to it, uh, and uh, now we actually have very, very uh, empirically successful MT systems. In fact, I, I think I figured out recently that if you look at all the language pairs that Google makes available for uh, to their uh, statistical MT service, they have basically been adding new language pairs at the rate of about two per day. Uh, and so this really delivers on the, the early promises of statistical MT, which they'd be able to build an MT system uh, in a single day. So they're actually building them in about half a day now. Uh, and so I like to argue that uh, because we've seen all of this movement in industry, generally when industry 
picks up a problem and they're spending a lot of money on it, it means that we, we've roughly solved it. So I could, I like to say, somewhat provocatively, that learning these very, very simple word translation models, which are the types of models that Google uses from big five text, is a solved problem. Uh, and as evidence for this, I will point you to the performance of a system in the annual workshop on machine translation, which is identified as Online B. Uh, so this is Online B's performance uh, across all language pairs uh, for the last few years. Uh, they basically take first place more than half the time, uh, and they're the only. This is the only system uh, that's been entered uh, for all language pairs on this task. And so, if these people are doing really well at this, uh, it does make you wonder uh, what problem the uh, academic researchers who are participating in this task uh, are solving. Uh, and they're basically doing this with uh, a lot of engineering and a lot of data, uh, but very very simple models. If you want to get the data, of course, there's ways you can do that something my colleagues and I um, in academia have been working on. So I, despite this, I think there are still a lot of open problems uh, in NT. Uh, my colleague Matt Post and I had a, a little opinion piece in this, uh, about this in a workshop last year at UNLP. Um, and so it's, once you start thinking about it, I mean, you think about the various places where we don't have parallel data, there are, there are lots of problems, uh, even where we do have parallel data, where we're not doing a good job. So machine translation of speech and informal texts, um, machine translation of, uh, of informal text is fun. I like the word pork here. So can people see what's happening with the word, the word pork in Spanish here? This is the word porque. Uh, uh, online media doesn't do a good job of translating it. Um, but also, um, really back to uh, the early problems of machine translation. So we still do not necessarily do a good job uh, at machine translating complex syntactic, semantic, and morphological phenomena. Uh, in other words, now that we've sort of mined a lot of the simple problems, we're still back to uh, the same problem, uh, which is building systems that understand language and modeling all of the phenomena that we see in the data. So we're able to model a lot of the simple surface, surface phenomena, but to get these things right, we have to build uh, more articulated models and really pay attention to what the linguists are telling us about this. And so, my particular view of, uh, of IT is not something that I came up with on, uh, on my own. It's something I sort of borrowed from uh, a well-known researcher uh, in MT, Kevin Knight, uh, who likes to say that uh, MT is basically automata theory plus probability plus linguistics, where uh, one sort of popular view of this is that linguistics tells you uh, what to measure, probability tells you how to measure, Automata theory, I think, really uh, gives you efficient algorithms for putting these, these things together uh, in structured problems. And I'll talk mostly about automata theory uh, for the rest of the lecture. So probably you didn't think you were going to come to an AT lecture and hear about automata theory, but that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so to give you a quick background on this and also sort of remind you how long this machinery works, here is a very, very quick overview of how something like online B works. So what the online view system does is it takes an input sentence like this. We split it arbitrarily into uh, substrings of words. Then uh, we take uh, those, uh, those substrings and we permute them in some way. Then we substitute uh, those Chinese substrings for English substrings. Uh, and finally, we run that past an engram language model. So we can actually think of this as just a big finite state transduction. So hopefully this is something that will connect not only the NT view, but also uh, this will be familiar to our friends in speech processing, where they use lots of uh, finite state automata and finite state machinery. So we basically got a transducer that segments the words. We've got some kind of, this isn't really a transducer, but you can easily write a function that takes a finite language and outputs a finite, finite language uh, that, that can take all permutations of the strings in the original language. So you can think of that as a kind of transduction. Uh, you've got a translation transducer that just substitutes things on the input for things on the output. Uh, and we also do have an engram acceptor. So if I put weights on all of these things, and I combine all of these transducers, I compose all these transducers together, uh, then I basically have a probabilistic or weighted model of translation. All right, so it's basically just a huge weighted finite state transduction. Um, I can write some function that's just a composition of all these transducers. Uh, and this allows the translation problem. And this isn't just merely an observation. It was an observation when like Kevin Knight pointed this out in the late 90s. Uh, but you can actually implement systems this way. Bill Burns' group at uh, the University of Cambridge in the UK has built an excellent 
a machine translation system using exactly this kind of technique. It's very straightforward. It uses uh, a lot of reusable machinery and therefore a lot of reusable algorithms, so we don't necessarily have lots of bespoke implementations of MT algorithms doing this. You can use just basic machinery of funny state on top of So over the last 10 years, <coughs> Um, there's been a lot of interest in uh, what's called syntax-based machine translation, so people recognize that this simple process of splitting up our sentence, permuting things, uh, and then translating them independently is kind of stupid. This isn't modeling language in any, uh, in any particularly deep way, so maybe we should use syntax in some way. Uh, so we're going to do some kind of uh, analysis of the sentence, and this is kind of a natural thing to do. You might imagine, so for instance, in Spanish, the adjectives come after the noun, in English they come uh, before the noun, so you want to capture that kind of regularity, and so using syntax in some way will hopefully be helpful with this. Uh, and so the formal machinery that we use for this is something called a synchronous context-free grammar. Um, this originated in the compiler literature in the late 60s uh, as something called a syntax-directed transduction, or syntax-directed translation. They were, um, uh, so this was actually invented for the purposes of translation. They were actually translating Algol into machine code, but nevertheless, it is uh, it's something that was originally designed for translation in the 60s. Um, and this was actually inspired by uh, work going on in linguistics, uh, particularly on the work of Noam Chomsky. Okay, so uh, synchronous context-free grammar looks very much like uh, a pair of uh, context-free grammars, where um, I've got a pair of grammars where the productions are linked, so that is there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these productions. Uh, and so I'll just write them like this, with the Japanese and an English side. And so, in addition to having the productions link, the non-terminals on each side of that comma are linked. And so you'll see that they're co-indexed in, in order to indicate that those non-terminals are uh, in correspondence with each other. And so, uh, what this thing does is it describes a translation relation. And I'll, I'll describe how it, how it does, uh, how it generates a pair of sentences actually. So the first thing we do is we write out our start symbol. Uh, and we're going to write this on both the, the Japanese and the English side. Uh, and then we're going to choose a rule to expand it. And so, since these non-terminals are always co-indexed in a one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, they're always going to be linked. And so, at every time, every time we pick up a non-terminal and expand it, we're going to expand it on both sides according to one rule. And so eventually we'll end up writing uh, a pair of trees like this, where the non-terminals are in one-to-one -one correspondence, and the trees are isomorphic to each other. Um, and at this point, I can just read off uh, a Japanese and English sentence. And so what this kind of model does is, uh, so a nice thing about this uh, is that you can then turn the problem of translation into a parsing problem. So given a Japanese string like this, I first parse it to some, uh, some tree representation of syntax, and then I get out the isomorphic English tree uh, and the isomorphic English string. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is that we can also think of this as a kind of transduction, uh, where this transducer in the center, the thing that transformed the tree, uh, the Japanese tree, to the English tree, uh, is something called a weighted pushdown assembler. I don't know how many people know what a pushdown assembler is. A lot of people have heard of synchronous context tree grammars but not so many people seem to know about Christian assemblers. This is the second half of the AHO paper. It's the part that no one apparently reads. Uh, so in addition to defining this formalism, the, they actually also define an automaton for it. And so uh, what's cool about this is you can actually uh, just define this as a big uh, transduction. Another way of thinking about this is it defines, uh, this kind of model defines a relation on string, basically a relation on two string languages. So, uh, given a pair, the, the string language that's defined by the Japanese uh, context tree grammar and the string language that's defined by the English context tree grammar, you actually get a relation that pairs elements of those two languages, those two possibly likely infinite languages. Uh, and so you can just use a bunch of uh, automata machinery to compute something like this. Um, and so this leads to some actually some nice sort of algebraic properties uh, that you can also quickly turn into algorithms and use them to translate. Okay, so I'll give you an example, something I learned from a friend here. Um, so the first observation I'm going to make uh, is about context-free parsing. I'll sort of remind you how context-free parsing works. So we give it a grammar as input uh, and also a string as input. And so essentially what I do when I'm, when I'm doing context-free parsing 
is whenever I see a word in the string and I see some rule that generates that uh, string, I basically make an inference that uh, the non-terminal on the left-hand side of that rule might have generated the words in that span. And so we do this for all of the words in the sentence. Occasionally, we might uh, infer that there are multiple possible ways I might have inferred words in a span. Uh, and so this is one kind of inference we make. In addition to this, uh, we'll also make inference of the form that if I see a pair of non-terminals together and I see that those, I might have already inferred that those, that pair of non-terminals might have uh, generated two adjacent spans in the same order, then I can infer that the pair of non-terminal on the left-hand side is going to those. And so this is basically just, you can actually think of it as a big proof process. So we basically prove that we could have generated uh, that span of words from the star symbol. And if we can prove that, then we'd actually parse. Uh, and so the nice thing about this is, uh, of course, we can add weights or probabilities to these things, and so then we can do uh, weighted or probabilistic parsing. It's basically a straightforward generalization of this algorithm. Um, we just add some numbers. Uh, another uh, important thing to remember or, or to remind you of about context view parsing uh, is that it's, uh, it's also a kind of intersection. Does everyone see this? It's an intersection of languages. Um, so, uh, to see this, we actually go back to a very old proof um, by Yehoshua Bar Hillel. So, this is uh, something that we way back in the 60s, something that we at Chomsky. And Bar Hillel's proof says the following: it says, given a context free grammar G and uh, a non deterministic finite state automata D, we construct a grammar G prime with the following properties. Basically, we're going to take every uh, rule in the grammar and every triplet of states in uh, the automaton, and we're going to build a new grammar rule. So the non-terminals of this new grammar in G prime basically consist of a non-terminal of the original grammar and a pair of states um, in the automaton. And so we do this for every rule, every uh, binary rule and every, every triplet of states, uh, then for every unary rule um, and every pair of states, such uh, that the transition between that pair of states generates the same string as is generated by uh, the rule here, we add this particular non-terminal, uh, this production of the grammar. Uh, we also have to add a, you know, a, a special memory rule to uh, generate um, final production. But basically what happens is that the language defined by this new grammar G prime is equivalent to the intersected uh, language, the language defined by the original grammar and, the, and its intersection with the language defined by the automaton. So in other words, this grammar is, it's quite easy to show, that this, this is like half of bar Hellman's proof uh, that shows that this grammar um, generates uh, the intersected language of these other two grammars, right? Um, and so this is quite useful. This, this is actually uh, a proof that uh, context-free languages are closed under intersection with variable languages, but it also turns out that basically you could, if you went backwards from what I did, just described, you could derive the CKY algorithm from this proof. Um, and arguably, what the CKY algorithm does is just, it's an efficient version of constructing a, a bar law construction. Um, so, context tree parsing is intersection. Um, and if we go back to our parse chart now, we can actually see that that is what CKY is doing. Right? So, if I take this particular inference that I made in CKY, this corresponds to a grammar rule in the bar law construction. So, if I take that entire chart and I read off the grammar that's in that chart, then I have a grammar that generates only this sentence. So now going back to our translation problem, uh, suppose now that the original grammar that we had was actually uh, the left-hand side, rather the, uh, the English side of some synchronous grammar. So I can take this new grammar and basically project it through my synchronous grammar. And what I get is a new grammar uh, that defines only uh, the uh, the sentences, uh, I'm sorry, only the sentence pairs in the relation defined by that synchronous grammar, uh, whose English side is the English sentence that I actually saw. So in other words, I'm just taking uh, some projection of that relation that includes only uh, the sentence that I actually saw. And so if we look at this grammar over here, we actually have a grammar that defines all the possible translations of this English sentence. And again, if we have probabilities on, the, on these, uh, we can take this thing, we can stream it past an engineer language model, and so we get an efficient algorithm for translation. Uh, and I want to, uh, as I said, uh, I actually got this idea from a friend, 
Um, so this isn't just a theoretical idea, you can actually implement this. And so my friend Chris Dyer, uh, who we just saw talking a few minutes ago, uh, actually did this a few years ago and wrote this really cool paper that not enough people have paid attention to that was in, uh, I think, at NACL a few years ago. Um, and so you get a very, very efficient algorithm uh, by thinking about translation in this very sort of algebraic way. Uh, with basically relations on strings. Okay. I want to make a quick technical point about um, synchronous context tree grammars, uh, and then I'm going to talk about some problems with this. So, um, it turns out, uh, so you might have noticed uh, there was a little bit of sleight of hand, right? So, I have this synchronous context tree grammar, it can express permutations on the string and alignments, um, but uh, it can do that in a polynomial time uh, algorithm because we're just parsing, right? So we're, Parsing, there's some, there's some extra constants in there to the, to the in-gram model. But I've got a polynomial time algorithm for translation, and we know that translation, where I just permute things arbitrarily, is be hard. Why is it possible? And the reason is because we can't express all uh, permutations with this synchronous grammar. Uh, and so here's an example of uh, a general grammar that cannot express this particular alignment. And the way to see this is that there is no uh, there is no binary branching process over paired spans uh, in these strings that can generate this alignment. Right? So for any pair of string, for any substring I choose in uh, the source sentence, there's no corresponding span in the target sentence. And so we can't actually represent this kind of alignment. Uh, this is interesting. There turns out to be a pumping lemma for this, and you can show there's an infinite hierarchy of these uh, synchronous computation grammars that can't generate um, for any, any particular line that you give me, um, I, or rather for any sort of maximum rank CF, SCFG you give me, I can show that there's some alignment that it can't generate. Okay, so this is just a technical point. This will come up later, so this is the only point, so I just want you to remember this. Um, there's been a lot of arguments about whether this is actually, uh, whether we actually need to generate this kind of alignment in translation. Um, so this is basically what I've done in the last 20 minutes is kind of taking you uh, up to the state of the art in statistical MT right now. So we started out with finite state transducers. Now we've done a whole lot of work on um, syntax-based translation, mostly in the last 10, 12 years. Uh, and so this is all based on these synchronous constants. These are very, very, very simple models of language. Um, in linguistics, uh, context for grammars, you know, they, were, they came about in the 50s in the work of Chomsky and then were sort of quickly banned into being followed the models of, of syntax. But so basically, in T is now up to the point where linguistics was in the 50s in terms of modeling language. Uh, so maybe that is not completely uh, adequate. So uh, I'm going to point out these are, in, in an abstract way, some problems that we have with uh, in T, some problems that we would like to address in our models. So natural language is arguably not context free. Um, there is actually a formal proof that natural language is not context-free. Uh, this is due to Stuart Schieber, uh, a computer scientist who was, uh, did some field work uh, way back in the 80s. Uh, and basically uh, had a number of Swiss German speakers attest that this particular pattern of homomorphism generates something like this, which is uh, non-context-free. So there are certain uh, aspects of uh, natural language that appear not to be context-free. Even if you don't believe this, this argument, it's actually, it's a really cool, it's a formal proof. Um, but even if you don't particularly care about this, maybe you don't care about Swiss German, uh, maybe, you, maybe you care more about simple languages uh, like English and Spanish and French, uh, it turns out that context-free grammars are not particularly adequate model of the syntax. You know? So if we're doing a syntax based on T, uh, it turns out that uh, context-free grammars are already problematic. Um, so part of the reason that we know this is because we know that um, context grammar grammars basically correspond to projective dependency grammar. There's been a lot of empirical work in dependency grammar in the last 10 years showing that for some languages, the number of non-projective trees is as high as 25%. Right? So for languages like this, uh, our context grammar model is going to be completely inadequate for modeling and syntax. Uh, none of these transformations, of course, preserve semantics. There's some com complex things that are going on, even simple sentences like this with a reference. Um, and there has been, there's sort of been a whole um, cottage industry of people trying to make these algorithms for complex uh, translation models efficient. 
Um, it turns out that there are various properties of simple context free grammars that actually make them inefficient when we have lots of non terminal symbols, which I'm going to talk about. And there's been like this whole industry of people that devoted to making this fast. Uh, and we're still not really not quite there yet. Google uses a little bit of context free grammars for translation system, but not a whole lot. So then this is just what we would like. Um, so we want some formal machinery um, to do translation that has a bunch of properties. And I'm not claiming these are the only properties that we care about, uh, but they definitely have some properties that care about that don't seem to be really captured by the kinds of models that we have now. So we have something that's linguistically expressive. I'm being somewhat intensely vague here. Um, we also would like, if we care about semantics, and there's, there's a small group of people uh, in NLP these days that are really thinking about doing machine translation with some explicit representation of semantics. A lot of this is, again, coming from ISI, Kevin Knight. So we want to explicitly preserve semantics. So we actually put the model in there somewhere. Um, we'd like to still have some efficient algorithms. We'd like to have some synchronous formal loop so we can put this into uh, some automata theoretic uh, framework and get algorithms out. So basically, we, my view is we really first have to write the, this model, which might be actually written in terms of some algebra. Uh, from that, you can often uh, derive uh, efficient algorithms and probabilistic models uh, using the same kinds of techniques that we use for context data uh, and synchronous context for your Okay, so that's a little bit heavy, maybe, but um, that generally seems to be true. So I'm going to propose uh, to look at one particular uh, formalism that might uh, solve this, or at least check all these boxes. Uh, and so I am not a linguist. So when I have a problem like this, um, I don't make something up. I generally go ask my linguist friends. So I was working in Edinburgh for a few years, as Chris mentioned. And so there's a well-known linguist there, Mark Stephen, who's been working on a particular linguistic formalism called combinatory categorical grammar. Um, and so I'm going to give you the, uh, the one-minute history of this. It actually goes back to uh, the 30s in the work of a Polish philosopher named Kozimir Adukiewicz. Um, and uh, so uh, Adik Kavitz had this uh, really nice formal system uh, that was not really, no one really paid much attention to it for several years. And then our friend Yehoshua Barhalel, uh, we discovered it in 1953. Basically, we discovered this old Polish paper uh, and wrote this really interesting paper and then worked on it for several years. And I'll, I'll touch a little bit on the work he did uh, later. Um, this was then uh, picked up by a number of people in the linguistics community in the 70s, most notably Mark Stephen and his, uh, and his colleagues. Uh, and so a number of people are using this now. Uh, CCG really is the basis for a lot of the current uh, large-scale semantic parsing systems that we see these days. So semantic parsing uh, is something that uh, has really taken off in the last few years. And so there's at least uh, there's a, there's a group at the University of Washington that is using this quite heavily. Um, and so it is something that we think we can do, uh, do represent some types of semantics with. Um, so in order to really get to the technical bit of this, I'm going to have to teach you a little bit about CCG. I'm just, there's a whole lot of stuff to learn, but I'm just going to teach you the minimal amount of stuff that you need to do, uh, that you need to learn to understand this. So it's going to take a few minutes, but just bear with me. It's hopefully won't be too painful. Um, so I'm going to start with something called categorical grammar. So categorical grammar is the original form defined by Adelaide's back in the 30s. Um, and it looks very, very similar to context-free grammar. Uh, and I'll tell you just how similar it is in a couple of minutes. Uh, so we have uh, a categorical grammar has a set of terminal symbols. So just, this is just a set of, you can think of these as terminals, just as in your context-free grammar. We've got a set of atomic categories, and you can think of these as non-terminal symbols, right? So these are non-terminal symbols in a context free grammar. Uh, and so, in fact, they have names that look very much like the names of uh, non-terminal symbols in your context free grammar. There is, of course, um, a special start symbol. Uh, and now we have something interesting. We have a complete set of categories. So the complete set of categories is actually infinite. Uh, and basically, the set of categories defined recursively is if A and B are categories, then A slash B and A backslash B are also categories. Don't worry about what that means, just go with it for now. Um, and then we have something called the lexicon. So the lexicon is basically going to be uh, a relation on terminals, categories, and lambda terms. Uh, don't worry too much about the lambda terms. Uh, they're going to be here for a little bit, and then we're going to do some sleight of hand and get rid of them. Uh, so the lexicon is defined this way. And so basically, this just defines a relation between basically words, these. Uh, 
categories that are built up out of uh, these non-terminal symbols and some semantics. So this is explicitly pairing uh, surface forms with syntax and their semantics. That's what it's doing. So that all seems like a lot of stuff. Now I'll show you how it parts with it, and hopefully this will make, make a little bit more sense. So, uh, but first a few uh, jargon terms. So when we have these, uh, what, these categories that are not simple like this, that aren't atomic, we call these functional categories. Uh, the functional category basically has two parts. The very first symbol is called the target category, uh, and the remaining symbols are called the argument categories. Uh, and so the way this is going to work is that uh, we can think of these, these uh, syntactic categories as functors, which take other syntactic categories as arguments and then return uh, some value. So this basically takes uh, an NP, a VP, and an NP as arguments and then returns a sentence. So that's how you can read that. So now I'm going to show you is how we recognize a sentence using this. So this is going to be a recognition algorithm. I'm not going to describe how this generates sentences, just how we recognize sentences, given the sentence and the app. So this is, again, this is just like, this is parsing. So how do we parse with a CCG? So uh, the first part of this actually looks very much like the parsing algorithm for a context free grammar. Uh, basically, whenever we see one of these, so something like the word we paired with an NP, we're essentially going to infer, infer that an NP could have produced that we. Uh, and we're going to do this for all the words. Okay? So basically, we make an inference here. I made this grammar conveniently uh, unambiguous in, 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 uh, in terms of what uh, syntactic categories could have generated which words. Uh, and so we get this is uh, sort of the first level of our CKY chart. We basically infer that these syntactic categories generate these words. Okay? So now we have to combine these. So how do we do that? So we're going to do this in terms of uh, some universal rules. Okay, these are, this is a, this is a meta rule. It generates rules of your grammar. So the way this works um, is it says, so we've got two universal rules. Uh, whenever I have two categories, A and B, it doesn't matter what A and B are. A and B can, can be any category. So whenever I see an A slash B with some syntax, with some semantics F, uh, next to a B with some semantics G, then I can infer that there is an A spanning that category, and I simply apply F to G. And we have the same thing for backwards application. And all this is doing is this, this is doing the same thing where B is on the other side of A. So let's show you what this looks like. So here's an example. Over here, I have a VP that's basically it's looking for an NP to its right, and I see an NP to the right. So I um, call uh, the VP there. That's going to be the primary premise. The NP is going to be the secondary premise. So the primary premise is basically going to absorb the secondary premise and give us some conclusion. So here we conclude or we infer that a VP spans uh, that part of the sentence with that semantics. Okay? So I'm just generating the semantics as I go bottom up, so the parts bottom up. So we can do uh, something similar over here. So one way to look at this, uh, if you look at these, um, if you look at these uh, complex categories, these functors over here, what happens with the functional categories is uh, that set of arguments basically behaves like a stack. Right? So what happens is I start out with some stack of arguments that have to get satisfied, and I pop them off from the end one by one. So if I keep doing this, so here's an example of backwards application. Here I'm just looking for the argument on the other side, so when I find the argument, I can make this inference. And so now what I've done is I've done two things. One is I proved that the sentence could be generated by the grammar, but I've also computed its semantics. So parsing is interpretation here. So parsing is basically computing some semantic representation. I'm completely punning on what that semantic representation is. That's why we're using these primes. Um, but this is basically how we parse the CCD. This is how we do recognition. OK. Um, so. A few interesting points about uh, this simple category grammar. Category grammar is context-free. So this is a context-free, uh, a context-free grammar that was discovered in the 30s. Chomsky did not invent context-free languages. Uh, so this was met in the 30s. Uh, again, Bar Hillel again came in here and proved that this is context-free. One way to see this is if we take this categorical grammar down here, we can actually write a corresponding uh, context-free grammar. 
I'm not going to do the other direction, but here's a corresponding uh, context tree grammar. It actually has a couple of interesting properties. Um, this context tree grammar is actually a lexicalized uh, context tree grammar, so that means there is a terminal symbol in every production. Uh, in fact, what it does is it defines a dependency language, it defines a projective dependency language. So if I take the CC, the CG parse, I can read off this dependency parse. So it turns out that not only is, is categorical grammar context free, it also is a projective dependency grammar. Uh, this is something that, that goes back to the work of uh, David Hayes. And, uh, do, do people know who David Hayes is? Does anyone know who David Hayes is? David Hayes um, uh, coined the term computational linguistics. And, was the first editor of the journal by that name. Uh, so he is somewhat important in the history of uh, CL. Uh, OK. So CG does all the, it has this interesting correspondence between dependency languages and, uh, and context free languages. OK. So now I want to tell you about combinatory categorical grammar. All right. So combinatorial categorical, uh, combinatory categorical grammar adds one extra feature. So the lexicon looks identical. Everything here is the same. But we're going to come up with a, an interesting problem. So we're going to, I have given you a grammar. It looks identical to the type of grammar I showed you earlier. Here's a string. I'm going to show you how the recognition process works in combinatorial category grammar. All right. So we start off, we basically just tag these words with their uh, syntax and semantics. And now we come up with an interesting problem. So here, I've got these two syntactic categories next to each other. Um, the syntax for half, it's got this VP argument that looks like it should be satisfied by this VP over here, except this VP is not atomic. It's still got an argument that it's waiting for. And in categorical grammar, we have to wait uh, until the secondary argument is atomic. Okay? So in this case, we can't do anything in categorical grammar. In combinatorial categorical grammar, we're going to add a new universal rule that will allow us to get around the problem. That looks hairy, but basically here's what it says. It says, if I see an A slash B uh, on the left, and a B with some stack of argument, some non-empty stack of argument categories that's next to it, I'm basically going to remove B from A's stack, and I'm going to push the remaining argument on B's stack onto A. So here's what happens. Uh, I make this inference, and what you want to see here is that this in P that was part of VP's argument stack basically just gets pushed onto S's stack. So it gets carried up. Uh, and so now the rest of this derivation is a straightforward categorical derivation. What's interesting about this is what it means is that the in P, which eventually uh, becomes the argument of a street, which means paint, is on the other side of uh, a street's uh, parent. So the uh, dependency analysis of the sentence looks a little funny. Uh, it's a non-productive dependency. Right? So here we've got this dependency uh, that crosses over some other dependency lines. Uh, and it turns out that if you squint a little bit, you can see there's this interesting connection between uh, CCG, which is known to be something called a linear context free writing, writing system. Uh, here's an example. A linear context free writing system is something that looks very, very similar to uh, a context free grammar with some extra power, um, it generates non context free languages, but uh, it turns out there's this interesting connection between CCG, non projective dependency parses, and these mildly non context sensitive languages. So, this is a lot of this, not the, CG, the CCG angle, but a lot of this is discussed in the work of Marco Coleman. So, Marco had a really nice paper at computational linguistics last year, which anyone who's interested in computational syntax should read. It's one of the best things I've seen in the last 10 years on the subject. Um, uh, so Marco and also Emily Kittler at Google have been doing some really, really cool work in this area. Uh, and so they're really kind of defining the set of non-productive dependencies that we actually see. Okay, so there's this, again, this non, this basically this crossing arc. And you see it's a result of uh, this argument getting passed out to its parent stack. Okay, so I want to prove to you, or at least give you the intuition about why this generates non-context-free languages, because remember we said we care about that. Um, so suppose that you have the CCG that's up there, that's simple grammar, and I want you to convince yourself first that anytime I see uh, a terminal symbol B in the string, 
I'm also going to see exactly one A and one C. So I'm always going to have the same number of A's, B's, and C's. And if I take this CCG and take its language and I intersect it with A star, B star, C star, I get A to the N, B to the N, C to the N, which is not a context free language. And as we know, context free languages are closed under intersection with regular languages, so this is not a context free language. Uh, if you look at the derivation here, you'll see part of the reason why this happens is that these CCG categories can become unboundedly large. So we just keep pushing more and more information on the stack until at some point we unwind that stack. Uh, and so what this means, in principle, we have an infinite number of categories in the CCG, uh, so we can code uh, an arbitrary history in one. And so this is what gives it its own content free power. All right, so some of the nice things about CCG. CCG is really fast and accurate. So I have a PhD student uh, at the University of Edinburgh, actually, uh, who wrote, uh, as far as we know, this is the best CCG parts of the soil. It's really, really fast. But even well before this, Stephen Clark and James Curran had a very fast CRF-based CCG parser in 2002, which is a good six years before any CRF-based CFD parser that I'm aware of. Although I be wrong. Someone will correct me on that if they know. Um, we, have been, we have been playing around with, for a while, the idea of trying to encode CCG into content-free grammars. Of course, this was some of their power, so this is work we did a couple years ago. This is a little bit disappointing, and part of the reason for this is because we're not really getting what we want, which is a relation on two CCGs. Okay, so here's the view of the world, and here's the problem that we're going to try to solve. Um, this is your hierarchy of abstract families of languages. Hopefully, most people are familiar with at least parts of this. Your regular, your context-free, your context-sensitive languages. Here we've got, I've added combinatory category languages, which is somewhere outside of complex tree, but somewhere inside something called the class of index languages, uh, which is interesting that I won't talk about. Um, so here's what we know. If I wanted to find a relation on two regular languages, I can do that using an FST. If I want to define a relation on two context tree languages, I can do that using a push-down assembler. If I want to define a relation on two combinatory category languages, but well, we don't actually know how to do that. Uh, so when I started trying to figure this out, I, I was like, I still a lot of searching through the literature, looking through uh, various reductions and other problems, uh, and it's just not really clear how you would do this. So uh, one thing you might I'll go back to this for a second. So one thing you might um, ask is, well, what I really want is remember I care about doing translation with semantics. So maybe what I should do is I should take my CCG parser, learn a semantic parser uh, in using CCG and say uh, an English semantic parser and a Spanish semantic parser. Now, I can look at the CCG itself as defining a relation between strings and semantic parsers in the form of what's called a nested word. Basically, uh, it's a dependency tree, it's just a tree. Uh, you can encode it as a kind of regular. So it's a relation between strings and semantics. And so maybe what I could do is I could ask the question, well, if I've got a relation from strings to semantics, and I take my other CCG and I invert it and I get a relation from semantics to strings, maybe I just compose those two relations together and I'll get a synchronous form of them for free. So uh, I want you to hold that thought in your head. So the question is basically, can, if, if I'm given two CCGs, can I compute whether uh, there are sets of strings defined by those two CCGs that have identical semantics? Okay, so this is the question. Uh, and to answer this question, I'm going to take a brief aside into something which I'll describe in terms of a card game. So, I want you, this is a computer science problem. I want you to suppose for a second that you've got some infinite set of cards and uh, there is a finite set of types of these cards. Okay, so I've got an infinite set of each of these, these types of cards. So the game is the following. Uh, what I want you to do is, given any arbitrary set of cards, I want you to lay down a sequence of cards such that the string of symbols on the top row is equivalent to the string of symbols on the bottom row. Okay, so here's a solution for this particular, uh, this particular game, right? So if you look at these two strings, they're identical. Read them off. It doesn't matter what the symbol are. Okay? Uh, is anyone, so the goal is, given a problem that's shaped like that, give me a solution that looks like that. How many people are familiar with this problem? Not too many. This is, uh, this, you should all know this, it's called the post-correspondence problem. Uh, it originated in a really beautiful little 
four-page paper by the philosopher Emil Post in 1946. Uh, it's widely used in certain types of proofs, which I'm now going to uh, sketch for you. So just keep in mind this post-correspondence problem. Right? So given an example of the post-correspondence problem, here's another, here's a rewriting of it in terms of symbols. These are my cards, one, two, and three, and those are the strings on the cards. The first uh, element of the tuple is the one on the top half, the second element of the tuple is the one on the bottom half. Okay, so if these are my cards, given an input that looks like this, I'm now going to write down two CCG members. So they will carry, don't worry too much about what they do. Um, the idea is this. For every card in grammar A and grammar B, I'm going to write three rules, okay? So for card one, I basically write those three uh, lexical entries at the top there, and you'll notice there's basically a correspondence between the element of the card and the element of the card uh, and the index of the card. So basically all, all the lexical entries look identical to this. We just encode these cards into these grammars, okay? So now a parse in, uh, say, grammar A looks something like this. And you'll see, basically what it does is it gives you a sequence, basically uh, some sequence of, of uh, the string on the set of cards, and the set of cards that I use to actually generate that sequence in order. Right? So it's basically the string and the index of the cards. Uh, now those, uh, so these, uh, oops. I'll run the wrong way for sure. So, okay. Um, so if you, uh, this is, now CCG semantics are actually uh, trees, but here they're just, if I took away those parentheses, you'll see that the string, these are actually monadic trees. Uh, monadic tree is just a fancy word for string. So I get strings that look like this. Okay, so now I want to ask you the question again. Um, can I find uh, pairs of sentences that have identical semantics under the CCG? Well, if I could do that, then I could solve the post-correspondence problem. So hopefully all of you saw where this is going. Uh, the post-correspondence problem is undecipherable. So what this means is that if you give me two arbitrary CCGs, and you ask me, are there, is there any pair of strings defined by this pair of CCGs that has identical semantics, the answer is, there is no algorithm that can decide the answer to that problem. Uh, not in all cases, okay? So this is an undecidable problem. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally am a little bit nervous when my translation model is undecidable. Um, so we're not going to do that. Uh, but it does mean that we've got this slight problem here. Um, so we don't have a synchronous formalism. So what I'm going to try to do in the next few minutes is sketch how we might actually solve this how we might define a synchronous CCG that gets around this undecided building problem. All right, so there's some fine print here. If you don't know anything about CCG, do not worry about this. This is, this is a very technical issue. Uh, I don't believe any of these technical, technical issues have any substantive impact uh, on any of the stuff I'm going to discuss for the next few minutes. Uh, but if you don't know, don't worry about it. So here's how I might define a synchronous CCG. A uh, synchronous CCG looks very much like a CCG, except rather than lexical entries uh, that have one word, they have two words. This is going to look very much like a synchronous context tree grammar. Okay? So, uh, some terms for you. We'll call the top half of this the left projection of the CCG, the bottom half the right projection. All right? Um, so, the first thing you notice is both the bottom and the right half, both the left and right projections are CCGs. Right? So, if I just ignore one part of this, I get a CCG. This is one thing I care about. Um, the other thing I want you to notice, we're going to require that the semantics of these words are isomorphic up to the ordering of the bound variables. So basically that means we're defining a lexicon and we're explicitly saying that these words have identical semantics. And they take some equivalent set of arguments. So because of this interface between syntax and semantics, we get isomorphic up to the ordering direction of the arguments in the syntax. All right? Okay, so here's the intuition. So given uh, a pair of sentences, uh, so if I want to recognize whether a string pair is generated by the sake of the CCG, each string must be a permutation in its projection of a shared set of lexical entries. That just means I have to define alignment. 
Um, each string has to be derivable in its projection. And they must uh, derive, uh, they must have a pair of variations of identical semantics, right? This is what we want out of the formalism. We want to be able to have uh, a recognition out of them on each side, and we want them to generate uh, identical semantics. Okay. So now what I might try to do here is I might try to define some synchronous derivation process in the same way that I do with context tree grammars, and you might notice a small problem with this, which is that the CCG derivation process is binary branching. And we already saw earlier in the talk that there is no binary branching derivation process that can produce this particular crossing line. Okay? This, so there probably is no synchronous derivation process. So um, what we're going to do instead is we are going to look uh, from a set theoretic view, right? We've been thinking about these things in terms of sets and after the sets of strings, sets of trees. So let's go back and look at what that view tells us. Okay, so here's kind of what we want. We want a string. So if we see a string that looks like this, we know that uh, if we take the dependency view of some derivation of the string, we basically get this dependency tree. I've just rewritten the dependency tree using the categories um, and projecting it down to the Swiss German string here. So since um, I've got these, these categories that are paired with some other categories, so this is something that's called a valency tree. It's basically a dependency tree. I can take my now synchronous lexicon. I can just project this tree, basically take a string homomorphism, produce another dependency tree, and I can then ask the question, is this dependency tree the analysis of, of the other string? So how can I answer that question? Well, this dependency tree is defined entirely in terms of CCG categories, so I can just take those CCG categories and I can parse the string. So what does this mean? This gives us an algorithm, right? So remember, I said, write down your algebra. That gives you the algorithm for recognition. So what does that look like? So given uh, a synchronous grammar and a string pair, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct uh, a new grammar that produces all and only the set of valency trees of the derivations of that first element pair. I'm going to project those trees through the synchronous lexicon, and I'm going to parse the other string with the projected grammar. Okay, this is exactly the same thing I showed you with context tree grammars. All right, so the trick is this: Can we solve this problem? Can we construct a CCG that produces all and only instead of valency trees of the derivative of U? Basically, in other words, this is an intersection problem, right? This is very much like Bar Hallel. So, is there a Bar Hallel construction for CCG? I started looking around. It's like, oh, this must be an easy problem. They solved it for tag and. Lots of other crazy looking formalisms. Can we do this for CCG? And you start looking, 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 and you don't find the answer. You're like, what's going on here? So I got a little worried. I emailed you know, Mark. And so Mark's answer did not make me any less worried. It doesn't appear to have an answer to this question. I thought, well, um, I really don't want to solve this problem. Uh, and Mark doesn't have an answer. So who, I mean, I'm not a mathematician. So it must require someone really, really smart to solve this problem. Who's the smartest person that I know? Um, so I just went into Jason's office one day. This is Jason Eisner, for those of you who don't know. I went to Jason's office one day and I just said that, that sentence to him. Uh, and for those of you who know, who know Jason, they appreciate this. He was sitting at his table and I, I, I come up and I say, Is there a constructive proof that CCG is closed under a section of the language? Jason left up from his table, table and he's like, Oh, it should be trivial. And he went to the board, he wrote down an answer. And I said, Jason, that's wrong, because I've been working on this for weeks, and so I had already gone through all these initial variations. And he's like, uh, okay, so let's tweak it a little bit. So he wrote something else down, and I was like, Jason, that's wrong. And he tried something else, and Jason, so we were in there for hours and hours and hours, and so we couldn't actually come up with uh, any uh, proof, either that you could do this, or that there was any kind of uh, construction that would work, and so it was very puzzling. It was very, very, very frustrating. Um, but then I thought about it for a bit, and I thought, well, I'm never actually going to translate an arbitrary regular language. Right? I'm just going to translate sentences. So sentences aren't actually arbitrary like regular languages. They're finite languages. So this, uh, now we might be able to work with. So we're going to represent the finite language with an acyclic, non like finite state automata. Uh, and this can still represent exponentially many strings. So if you want to translate speech, or you want to translate morphology lattices, or tokenization lattices, or whatever, or whatever kinds of crazy things you care about, uh, we can still we can still work with this. Okay. 
So I am going to sketch this really quickly because I know we're on time again. The purpose of this is intuition. So the idea is that given a dependency analysis of the string, I want to come up with something that looks kind of like a bar Hallel construction. Uh, and so it's going to look something like this. Basically, for each uh, symbol in my dependency tree, I'm going to annotate it with the span, uh, its corresponding span in the yield. Except you notice I have this one problem with the VP. The VP actually spans two disjoint spans of the output. So what is that going to look like? And I'm just going to tell you the answer. The answer looks something like this. It's just a little crazy construction. Um, I, if you talk to me offline, I can explain more about why it looks like this. But um, the intuition has to do with the compositional behavior of these categories. Basically, when I'm combining two CCG categories uh, in the derivation that looks like this, I'm basically combining two fragments of those valency trees in a particular way. So if we take this all the way forward, the idea is this. So in this derivation, this VP at first is going to span positions six through seven. And then at some point, I have some remainder from this rule. So I'm going to record that remainder in the construction. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to see that at this point, I actually span everything from three to seven with a gap from five to six. And so that's my construction. If you think about this, for those who are familiar with tree adjoining grammar, this looks very, very similar. There's a reason for that, which I won't go into. But um, uh, I'm not going to walk through this. But uh, if you want to talk to me offline about why this works, I can talk to you in great detail about it. But uh, this is kind of the bones of the construction. So what we now have is, uh, let's go back to our recognition problem. So G prime, this G prime now produces, now can uh, parse only strings that have this particular valency tree. So in other words, only sentences that have this semantics can be produced by the CCG. Interestingly, this doesn't mean that it's only the string language. There are actually other strings that I didn't see that, also, that it will also produce. Uh, but they all have this particular semantics. So now again, we've got our synchronous uh, lexicon. So we're going to project this new CCG through that synchronous framework. The way that works is I just look here at my category, and I'm going to create a new version of the, of the category on the English side just projecting the annotations across. So I get a new English CCG that looks like this. And now we have um, solved this problem. So coming back to uh, a thread that I left open a second ago, I said that we can only do this for finite languages. So why not arbitrary regular languages? And so this turned out to be really sort of vexing and hard and annoying to solve it. If any of you have any idea, I would be happy to talk to you about it. So suppose I have this regular language up there, a, b, b, star, and I want to intersect it with this CCG down here. So it turns out I will get crazy analyses that look like this, that have the property that, now imagine that you just continue extending a, you know, you get some very long string from a, b, b, star up there. What you'll discover is it has an arbitrary number of gaps. And so what this means, the, the number of gaps of this, uh, in this dependency analysis is unbounded. This is what's called um, block degree or gap degree dependency parts of literature. And it turns out that the block degree, the gap degree is unbounded. Uh, and this is a problem for our construction uh, because it means we're going to use an infinite set of categories, which we do not want, atomic categories. And so I have no idea how to solve this. So if any of you have any idea, if you follow up to this point, I'd be very curious to talk to you. Um, so uh, a few final things, um, and this is very open-ended. Um, there is this interesting property that these uh, CCG have, so that they actually parse to um, basically a semantic graph. It's not just a dependency graph. So if I extend them, you know, if I uh, use particular forms of these uh, lambda terms, I get something that looks like this. This is all the way back in 2002. This is long before uh, the NLP sort of community really started thinking about uh, semantic graphs um, last year, I think. Uh, and so uh, this is quite interesting. I mean, this has been there all along that you could do this. And so uh, it's interesting to kind of look this up to things like abstract mean representation. Um, there is a whole bunch of open technical problems here, uh, which I won't really talk about. But uh, the conclusion is I do think 
um, that just in terms of writing down like what our model would look like if we have a CCG, we might actually have some kind of solution for this, right? So given the algorithm that we described, we can derive uh, the algorithms, the intersection proofs, and everything else. Um, and so I think that we actually have something that's approaching a, a proper synchronous model here. Uh, and the other thing I want to impress on you, especially for your students, is to really pay attention to your formal language theory. So there are lots of problems that you can encode uh, in natural language as uh, automata uh, and formal language theoretic uh, problems. And so it's very, very helpful to understand how this sort of stuff works. So I will just leave you with that. Thanks. constraints on the unaligned arguments and the other side, and depending on how you formulate this, like how local those constraints are, I think you can still uh, prove a lot of the same properties. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've been working on this for a while, so uh, in order for this to be really useful, you would have to do something like that. Uh, but that would also be true for any number of sort of synchronous dependency system, which you really should try to figure out how to build. We have uh, we have set solvers to solve the, like problems that are maybe hard. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, like theoretically, they are theoretically they are tractable, but we have lots of heuristics to do good things. Yeah. yeah. Do, we, do there exist solvers that act as oracles to all the problems, even though you know in the general case we could never do this? But like, yeah, what, I, what I basically say, can you solve the PCP problem? Just actually, can you solve it? I mean, do we have do we have solvers that like act as multiple oracles for many 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 common cases? I don't, I don't, I don't. Uh, so, so there's a good question here about whether it matters that it's undecidable. I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. Uh, so it's undecidable, that means there are instances that we uh, are going to have problems with. We can't write them down and we'll solve all instances. But uh, whether that actually matters is, I, I can, we can go on a long digression about this. Uh, it partly depends on whether there's some constraint on the semantic forms. So I was using a fairly arbitrary property of uh, the semantic representation in TCG to come up with this proof that there is no way to essentially compute arbitrary semantic equivalence. I should mention, by the way, that that is a completely straightforward um, recoding of the fact that intersection of context free languages is undecidable. Um, and so what that means is it also carries over to a large number of other semantic formalisms, uh, in particular ones that have been used in machine translation, something called hybrid replacement grammar. Um, now that being said, I spent a good part of July at a workshop uh, with a bunch of other people thinking about semantic MT, and so we have started to think about constraints on the semantic representation that make this problem go away. Uh, so that was a kind of long hand maybe part of There's a lot, there's a huge amount of technical um, that's kind of enough outline of where I think this is going. So I think we might be able to solve it by carefully constraining what our semantic representations actually look like. So is uh, CCG basically a CFG equipped with a stack? Um, that's a pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good way of viewing it. It's a C. It's um, it's actually almost a notational variant of something called a linear index language. Because, uh, I don't know if that helps. Because if that was so, then uh, CFGs are equivalent to pushdown automata. Yes. And uh, you equip a pushdown automata with, a, with an additional stack and it becomes as powerful as a Turing machine. Yes. Yeah. Are CCGs mm -hmm. equivalent to Turing machines then? Oh, no, 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 no. We don't have two stacks here. This is. Um, the stack in the CCG is on, it's on the, tr the stack controls the tree language. So what, what that means, and if it, 
I don't know if this will mean anything, but if you look at uh, your set of derivation trees, so I look at the path language in those trees, that is a path from a root to any leaf. If I take the collection of those paths, they, are a con they define a context-free language. This doesn't give it, um, so what that is to say the stack in the CCG is orthogonal to the stack in the string case. So it's not interacting with the string stack. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a clear way of putting it. But this is definitely, uh, it definitely is polynomial parsable, uh, and most of its properties are decidable in the model case. Actually, I think they're all decidable. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's, and I spent a long time looking at this actually. So there is. So this was, and this was the thing that led me to believe that this should be possible, right? Because A, we know that uh, CCG and TAG generate equivalent string languages under a very large number of assumptions, a few of which I'm actually violating. Um, and B, that there is a constructive closure proof for TAG. So therefore, it seems like it ought to be trivial. Unfortunately, it turns out, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, basically the, the problem is that Going, uh, the construction for CCG to tag is actually CCG to lig to head members to tag. So it's, very, it's a very, very nasty construction. That's one problem. The second and more important problem is that it actually breaks the semantic dependencies in the CCG parts. That is, it generates string languages, but it doesn't generate the same structures. And this turns out to be important because there's actually, there is a really cool proof, again by Marco Coleman, that shows that the set of dependency, uh, basically the set of dependency trees over strings that can be generated by CCG, uh, CCG can generate dependencies that can't be generated by TAG, and TAG can generate dependencies that can't be generated by CCG. So they have a large set of dependencies that are equivalent, but it appears that they do it by some incomparable mechanism that we don't understand. I'm sorry? Um, so up until about 2000 or so, uh, people came up with them by writing them down. And this was, a lot of this comes back to like formal linguistics work. Um, but now we actually have uh, CCG tree banks, and you can train them. They're statistical parsers. Uh, and so you induce the grammars in a very simple way by reading them off the tree bank. Uh, I should say, though, in uh, Luke Zunwein's work, that they are inducing uh, grammars in a slightly more difficult way. So they don't necessarily have the categories, but they have ways of hallucinating categories and associating. They, when they have a string to pair with semantics, but they don't have the intermediate uh, derivation. Um, so uh, my guess is, so I haven't talked at all about how we do induce a synchronous CCD. I have a lot of ideas about how we might actually do that in practice. Uh, but you would definitely start with uh, a regular statistic parser, and there are ways that you can product the category across. Um, and so this is, again, this is induction in some ways is an empirical problem, which I have not gotten as far as empirical problems yet. So purely figuring out the math is surprisingly hard here. Uh, I'm not actually sure. Sure. So in practical parsers, they sometimes make this assumption and they sometimes don't. Uh, and there's actually some interesting, there's a lot of debate about it. Um, and some of it is actually purely mathematical. So there, there are a lot of interesting mathematical properties when we get into these higher order representations that are, you just let go and you just like, oh, this should be obvious and then solve this and then we solve it. It's a really good question.